in existence, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, so this is Todd Atkins, and I'm here with the MMA detective, Mike Davis, and veteran matchmaker, Miguel Iterati from the Lights Out podcast, the best MMA history podcast anywhere, and you can find it on YouTube at Lights Out, L-Y-T-E-S, Out podcast. Check it out. And today we're going to discuss kind of the updates of this uh, James Krause um, gambling controversy with the UFC. There's been some new developments. So um, I might go to Mike first, because as a promoter, you know, with the suspension of Kraus and the cutting of Derek Minner from the UFC, maybe kind of talk about that from a promotional standpoint, because, you know, this is kind of in your area. Okay, in regards to Derek Minner, now, first and foremost, none of us are speculating here. Like, you can find people on the internet, Jesse on fire being one of them, pretending like he knows something, which he obviously knows nothing in this instance. We're not going to do clickbait stuff. We're just going to tell you what we know, and that's it. So Derek Minner, him being cut. Okay, James Krause being suspended, having his credentials revoked, everything being put on pause while this investigation takes place is absolute protocol nothing is pointing towards guilt at this time because of those things that took place with him anybody saying that he got raided uh got arrested anybody doing that stuff you probably should stop watching them because if they're clearly lying about this who i mean who else who knows what else that they're bullshitting about so you should just stop altogether if that's what you're looking for and that's what you're listening to now. There was no raid or anything of that nature that took place. James Krause was never arrested. Derek Minard being cut is a part of the process. It's There's nothing out of the ordinary. Now, him being able to fight while this investigation takes place, Dude, James Cross might not even be able to operate his gyms while this investigation take, takes place. It's just, it's a part of the process. The federal process, man, it's, it's, I, I mean, I'm trying to pick and choose my words carefully. Yeah, you don't um, want to get caught in it. No, no, you don't want to get caught in it. You absolutely don't. Like, for instance, let, let me just give you a couple examples. Everybody watched The Tiger King. Everybody liked it. They watched this methed out gay cowboy with uh, with cats. And it was just, I mean, it was incredibly entertaining on Netflix. One of the most watched series ever. The feds got a wire and had their, you know, had their undercover informant get him so high that he was like on a different planet, recorded him, baited him into saying things. And then when he got arrested for an alleged murder for hire, which was completely set up from the beginning, at least on what you could see, you know, through Netflix, but that's not everything. There's more sides to that story that they leave out intentionally in order to, to build sympathy. So when he wanted to have his story heard because there's, Dan, I was so high on drugs and it was a setup and it was my employees and, man, I just kind of want to have my story told. What they'll do is they'll, they'll pull you in a room and they'll say, I'm just going to give an example. This is not something that's been said to anybody involved in this case. We're going to give you three months if you plead guilty. And then the other person is going to go, but this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. Okay. If you step out that door, it's going to be two and a half years. When we see you in three weeks, and then he walks out the door thinking they're lying and then walks right back in within 30 seconds. OK, I'll take the deal. They will take the deal off the table and then give you the extended period when they come see you again. At which point you start saying to yourself, they keep chalking on time and I just want to have my voice heard. That guy was probably offered under a year and now he's doing 20 because he wanted to have his voice heard. The federal government is not somebody you go to trial against. The only people that take the feds to court, crooked cops and gangsters. And I mean like the Italian kind. They're the only two people that really take the feds to trial. It's, 
like, like federal law is so specialized that the people that actually are trying to fight their case with attorneys, it's more to negotiate their time down. It's not to actually fight the case. When you've got wiretaps and the wiretaps, the feds don't have to tape 100% of the conversation. Whenever it's something that is not a part of the case, they turn the wiretap off. And then when it's starting to build towards the case, they turn it back on. That's also a fancy way of saying that they can edit what it is that they have. Like look at Rod Blagojevich, former governor for the state of Illinois. His biggest argument was, wait a minute, you guys are editing these wiretaps. They offered him like a year and a half. He took 18. Our former president had to pardon, pardon him. The person that's our current governor here in Illinois was the person on the other end of the phone call trying to buy the seat. Dude, you do not want to go to court with the federal government. Sorry, there's my long tangent. Now, I do want to follow up, though. I want to ask you as a promoter, you know, um, with the UFC cutting mentor. It's probably more than likely the end of his career unless he's exonerated completely. Is that a decision you would make? Or did they not have a choice to make it? Why? Dude, you got to remember, if you're the UFC, this is about gambling, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. How much money do you think the UFC makes from sponsors with gambling or maybe casinos that might be you know, owned or owned wholeheartedly or partially owned by casinos or, you know, any, anywhere that they do business where there's a casino involved, how many of their places? Probably quite a few. So what the experts aren't telling you, and I, I can't believe they're not even mentioning this, the gold standard in regards to blackballing somebody in a casino is the Las Vegas black book. Now the Las Vegas black book, you can Google, Google search it. There's about 50 or 60 names on it, mostly Italian. That black book also includes names of people that haven't even set foot in any of the Vegas casinos, but it's people that if they caught a whiff of somebody that's trying to fix a game or, or manipulate odds, their name goes on that and they're not allowed in any of the casinos. Once your name gets on that and you don't have to be guilty, there's no process or anything like that. You're done. So that, that Las Vegas black book in regards to banned people. Once you're on that, man, it's pretty much over. It's pretty much over. And that's that's different than a federal case or the feds that are investigating James Krause. My belief, this is just my opinion. I hope James Krause is innocent. What he did was nothing that was illegal, technically, as long as he didn't obviously break any laws. But gambling on, like gambling on, on the UFC, it was legal. Or it still is legal, except in a few, I think, Ontario Bandit, somebody else. But he wasn't doing anything illegal. He had a 1% podcast. I, I never listened to it. It was on Fight Pass, which talked about gambling. So it's not like this is something hidden. This isn't a secret. It's just he gambled on fights, something that the UFC allowed. The NBA doesn't allow that. Hockey doesn't allow it. You know, none of the major sports. I think this is just the UFC kind of changing to the next level. Like when Reebok came along, oh, we got to get kind of get rid of the racing car style style trunks. You know, now obviously it's Venom and Crypto.com. This is just the evolution of mixed martial arts, in my opinion. Right now, Miguel, before I throw it to you, I do want to say something. John McCarthy and Josh Thompson were also speculating, so we should also mention okay. them. I think that's fair. Would you allow me, Miguel, or do you want to do you want to comment? No, on Mike, that? go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. All right. John Fitch. John Fitch knows nothing is his podcast. I like John. Um, I listen to his podcast, listen to updates. You know, it's just I put it on my car and I go. I want to say about two months ago, I've got the I've got the episode flagged. He had talked about Josh Thompson in particular and referred to him as a dirt ball. Those are his former training partners words that came out on John Fitch's podcast. 
And the reason he called uh, Josh Thompson a dirtball was because he said he owns a UFC gym. He's come out publicly against the unionization of uh, of the fighters and the fighters union and stuff like that. And he went after he went after Josh Thompson in regards to it and about how he's not on a UFC payroll, but he does get a significant portion of his income from it. So um, Josh Thompson, what, what exactly did he say? No, I mean, Josh Thompson, John McCarthy were saying that like over a million dollars of bets came in on this fight, which, you know, I don't know if that's what do you guys think of that? Wait, wait, wait. was it from one person or that was the overall kind of action? It sounded like they were implying that it was combined, not one person. OK, Miguel, that's, better. that's your court, not mine. You know, <clears throat> I don't know. I just I see. I see a real problem here, and it has to do with a lot of what you've been talking about. You know, now the feds are involved, okay? But that that doesn't take away the fact. And then you've got the casino black book. Those are two completely unrelated things that are both moving against you. And then add to that your employer. Now you've got three people all moving against you. That's a really bad sign. That's a really bad sign. Banning all the fighters. And he's not allowed to be in the corner. He's not allowed to. So effectively, his gym is going to be, you know, not cranking out professional fighters. And he had a good gym. Now, Minner, if him and James decided to go into that fight and not give their all effort to try to win and lose it, then he is in breach of his UFC contract and deserves to be cut. Simple as that. It's simple as that. Whatever, whatever other problems there are, the, now the Nevada State Commission comes in. Now, the Nevada State Commission is going to have a, an aspect of theirs that also looks at gaming. And just because ga- gambling is becoming legal in some places, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have this, you know, a lot of unexplainable stuff happen. So <clears throat> if one person wanted to bet a million dollars on this fight, that person probably has a connection in a casino or in a book already and is known as a high roller. And these people will decide whether they can take the risk on that fight or not. So that's probably not the case here that it all went in under one person. So now Kraus may have combined a bunch of people and maybe gotten close to a million dollars. They put up enough action on this fight that it raised flags across sports books and casinos. So what that involves is, is, you know, having multiple accounts open in multiple casinos. Now, I can open an account at Bodog and Bet Phoenix and, you know, as many casinos as I want under my name. But again, the minute I take somebody else's account or whatever, regardless of like what you want to say about it, you've explicitly opened your account saying that you will not do that. So once you've given them that, yeah, you broke our the, 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 the rule that we give you, they can ban you completely too. All right. Now, what the, feds, what the feds are going to look at is they're going to look at the integrity of this whole thing. Because if they're faking fights and people are taking bets, inevitably, there's been a loss there. Somebody's going to lose money and whoever's going to be losing here. How about all the people that didn't know and bet Minner? They should be pissed. They're well, not here. even going for an effort. No, hold on, Mike. I can open up because, on that. Yeah, You know, yep. th- th- because th- there's a lot to it. So now... Take this back a bunch. Now, this is me speculating. But, hey, you when you get caught with your DUI, it's unlikely that that's the first time you actually drank and drove. But Krauss got caught this time. What are they going to find in the background? Because if there's a fight a year ago that there was, oh, you know, $100,000 worth of action on or something like that. But we don't know if he got caught, Miguel. No, I, I understand that. But what... The, all of this is what's coming because, unlike, you know, because if they do find something like that, he's going to be in real trouble. So what happens here? The casinos, no matter what happens, the casinos, each casino takes money for, for the game or, or, or the fight. And if they could win, they could win money, even if, win, if, if Minner lost the fight, the casino could still win money if a lot of action came in on the other guy or, or on Minner, rather. Well, they would have even adjust their odds. Yeah. So, yeah but but here's the problem. Here's the problem is, is if you go back and there are fights 
where the casino, the house is lost, then they can definitely press charges on. Okay. You know, and you, what happens if you're the actual better? That now you've you, again the gambling industry is based on a lot of relationships. So people stay at these houses. Now they now here's the guy who bet fifty bucks on Minner this fight and go and calls his casino and wants it back. Now do that for a fight a year ago. Now do that for a fight actually somebody actually bet a million dollars on. Like act, they took a high roller's fight. They took a high roller's money. The casino will have to, if a high roller bet Minner a million dollars on just one guy, he would get his money back because they would want to keep him. So it's very, it's very, we, when, when we did shows at the Trump Taj Mahal, we paid nothing for the building, zero. They gave us the building. All we did was promise that one Russian high roller would show up. And he did, sometimes with friends. But those when that guy bet, that his presence made the entire show, the entire evening, worth it to the casino. So there's levels to this game, and James Krauss is not on anywhere near that top level, no matter how much he wants to throw around big numbers and that he's a big deal in this stuff. He's not. And, in order, and who knows what goes on with those guys. And in order for us to not see what goes on with those guys, they are going to crush him, and things will go on business as usual. All right, so Miguel, fantastic as always. So Todd, let me ask you a question. The people that come up with odds, are we pretending that they just watch a bunch of videos and they kind of see this guy matches up well here or there? Or do you think they're out there collecting information as well to kind of help set the number in regards to where the fight is supposed to be at? What's your opinion of that? No, I, I agree. It's the latter, especially today. In the earlier okay. years, it might have been more like the previous. Okay. But, yeah, well, you're right. Here. So, in essence, we got James Krause giving his odds, saying who's going to win, his little picks. And he's a fight coach. And he's in locker rooms. And now everybody's saying, well, he shouldn't be allowed to do that. Well, the worst kept secret in the industry in, like, the early 2000s was – Joey Odessa's relationship with Phil Baroni. Anybody pretending that the person working out at AKA wasn't calling Joey Odessa on a daily basis, either they're just, they're unaware or they're stupid. It's, it's one of those two things. So you're going to sit here and say, Greg Kalikas, who Miguel worked with in the past, lives in the same country with him. I think he can, he's 15 minutes away from where he lives. Greg Greg's Kalikas. The promoter. No, 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 no. Greg's the promoter. Nick's the, the bookie. I apologize, Nick Likas. So Nick is a brilliant mind. When you watch Nick Likas's gambling show, the amount of work that he puts in just to knock it, knock those numbers down by a fraction of a point, sometimes can be two, three days of just pouring over information. So Nick Likas, also his job is to gather as much information because he's he's. You know, a bookmaker. So Nikolikas can talk about picks, but James Krause can't. So that, that's where we're at here, right? Now, Nikolikas is an industry insider. He 100% is, and he's, like I said, in the industry, he's very well respected. And it's shocking how few Instagram followers Nick has. Because it should be through the roof. That's the guy that everybody should be watching when you want to know odds, things of that nature. So did you watch, Todd? This is how an investigation is conducted. That For that UFC in particular, with Minard on the card, did you watch Kalikas' show, his odds show? Yes, I poured over the, the show beforehand and the one after it. Okay, so you watched the show beforehand. Now, an insider, somebody that's got profound knowledge in regards to what takes place. Everybody says Dana White runs Vegas. I have no doubt in that. But in regards to making odds, Nick Kalikas is somebody that is very fortunate in regards to gathering information. What was the pick on Nick Kalikas' show? Well, they brought a guest on, and, and surprisingly, he said Menor was a good play because... They their reasoning was that Nerd and Becky was more of a grappler. Menor had maybe close to 30 first round finishes. He's had a ton of fights. And they felt that Menor would be a good play given that scenario. Okay. 
did Kalikas, did he look funny? Did he go look left, right? Or did he disagree with it? No. He didn't at all, correct? No. Okay. So Nick Kalikas, if he was trying to build his platform, would have just put his foot down and said, nope, it's a bad one. I heard Manor's having some injury issues, blah, 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 blah. That heavy other guy. That's what Kalikas would have said. Now, let's just say Kalikas wasn't adept in, in, in understanding of that information at that time. When you're talking about a million dollar swing, there's a lot of mouths after that. Did Kalikas say anything in regards to that fight the show after? No, and no, he didn't. And that surprised me because he kind of played it off as that that he's seen that kind of stuff before as far as line movement goes and that it wasn't necessarily all that alarming. Okay. So now, when jerk-offs like Jesse on fire, Jesse Merle, say, you know, James Krause's house got raided, he's under arrest, oh my God, we're going to hashtag Jesse on fire and Jesse Merle. Todd, did Jesse Merle ever call you and ask you to unhashtag him because he's applying for jobs? Not that he asked me to unhashtag him, but not to remove stuff that had his name on it, yeah. Okay, so Jesse Merle is going to go on talking crazy shit about somebody that's going to lose his house and his job but wants you to remove his name because you know he's you know applying for coals or something like that or working at a gas station right do you think that's fair no not really okay so we're going to hashtag jesse merle in this and jesse on fire unless he wants to come on and say well you know i was hypothesizing we're not going to accept that we're going to say if he comes on and says I was making shit up for clicks, then we'll remove it. But Jesse Merle is a piece of shit for doing that. James Krause, I don't know him. I've never met him. You know what I mean? Like, I know who he is. He definitely doesn't know who I am. He's guilty. He's innocent until proven guilty. And what we're watching here is the federal process. My concern is the corruption within the federal process in itself, they want to get a guilty plea so bad to where even if you're like 2% innocent or 2% guilty, but 98% innocent, and it's kind of like, well, wait a minute. No, 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 no. They want that guilty plea. And it's a scary, scary position to be in. And I don't take joy in anybody having that type of pressure on top of them. Yeah, I, I do want to ask. Good, I'm sorry. I want to ask one question that just came to my mind. Now that we've been talking about this subject for a while, not just today but previous, is that the feds have announced that they're investigating? It's normal. Is that in, you know what I mean, or that this is a federal investigation? It's normal, right? But you know, in some instances, like the Mike Miski case, which I'm covering, obviously, um, on Oahu. They didn't want the person to know that they were being investigated. No, no, so what's no, the difference not, there? I'm just asking. Okay. okay, so for instance, what they'll do is they'll they send you an actual letter that you're being investigated. And at that point, at the point of the announcement, you have to assume the last six to eight months of every single text message, DM, IM, whatever it is, email, every even phone conversations have been listened to or read. That's what that means. And, you know, a raid, we're going to raid. Everything's in a cloud. Yeah, it's, this isn't like you're, you're storing something on an HDMI thing. It's, it's on a cloud. There's no reason to ever raid anybody in instances like this. Okay. Yeah, I was just asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Miguel, go ahead. Yeah. I apologize. You know, I, everything Mike hints at and all you know, he's talking about and also just the history of the sport you're seeing a major escalation here. And that's what Krauss is, is is in the crosshairs of. Because back in the day with Odessa and Baroni, you know, Baroni's a guy who's making 30, 40K a month, uh, you know, a fight. You know, he's from Long Island. Maybe he's got a little bit of money, but, uh, you know, Baroni, they, they were making two, $3,000 bets maximum. Do you know what a sports book is? Baroni was getting paid for his information. But, no, no, but the sports books to that level of betting, two, three thousand bucks, never would give a shit. 
this is this is when gambling on UFC to you know back then when gambling on UFC was just beginning to be accepted by some of the books. People were playing it. All the books got caught by guys who knew more than they, they, they than they did in those days. So, but but, but Baroni, it doesn't compare. Yeah, yeah, there might be inside info, this that, or the other thing, but he's never going to break a radar making five. You know, there may have been five hundred dollar limits on bets at that point. You know what I mean? And and to you know, you make a five hundred dollar bet and it pays six times. You got three thousand bucks back. You do that a couple of times a month. You know. Baroni could lead a good lifestyle, stuff like that, but the book isn't really going to care about that. The idea here is that this guy, now things are escalating, and this guy did break the threshold that he did now get noticed by the books. This doesn't mean that Baroni may not have broken a book and, say, and they say, look, you know, we don't want you anymore. You're, we're going to label you a pro gambler. And he goes to another book and starts there. It was small-time shit. When you're talking about faking a sport that's now on ESPN, the people that and their gambling entities where like for example i i saw canada or part of canada said we're no longer going to take bets on ufc everybody who was, everybody who was in a casino in ontario taking those bets and stuff like that has now been affected they can't do that anymore so that all grew that wasn't there at one point now it is and it all just died immediately because of this a lot of repercussions right. off of this so yeah i think mike's idea that the federal government is going to pressure for, you know, to make an example. I think, well, yeah, I think this, we see the reasons why. Okay. Now he can sit here. Now the people at home are going, but then why would he throw two kicks with the same side where he was injured? And dude, that's, that's, that's a legit question. So let's talk about why let's talk about somebody that is probably making just, just over the, the minimum at a UFC level to fight at the UFC level, which is, I think that's that's where Minard was at. Let's say he blows his knee out in practice for his fight, and he needs surgery, and his fight's like four or five days away. Minard, let's just say he doesn't have insurance, because I don't know that he does, but that he does or does not. Let's just, I'm just giving him as the example, but there are fighters in that position that do not have insurance and the type of surgery that is needed is considered elective or cosmetic, cosmetic. So, well, you can kind of walk on it. You know, you can't run a marathon anymore, but you can walk on it. So if you're working with the state, we're not going to give you surgery. His career effectively at that point is over. So what does he do? Chris Lytle's talked about it on our podcast all the time. Yeah, you go into the emergency room after a UFC, the entire locker is there. Your locker room is there. Oh, I hurt my back here. I got this. I got that. They're all going in there with injuries and getting cleaned up afterward. It is just, what it is. Just for the record, Derek Benner obviously has got a lot of fights, and, and they don't have his complete record, but they should have most of his UFC earnings, and his career disclosed earnings on uh, Tapology are about fourteen thousand dollars. Yeah, th those are off. Those are off, but it's yeah, it's not yeah, much higher they, than that. No, yeah. what they do is they add up the ones that the boxing committee. He's fought in places where the boxing commission uh, releases that information, and that's what they add up there. But yeah. it, it hints at you know, he's got more than one or two UFC fights, and it hints at you know he's definitely on the lower end of the pay scale. Thank you, Miguel. So that that's the reason why people go into fights. Hurt, like TJ Dillashaw, like Aaron Pico. They go into fights hurt because they know, hey, man, I can take a loss here or, you know, and, and then get my surgery or tell the UFC, well, you know, I blew up my knee. I don't have insurance. I can't pay for this. You know, nice meeting you. I'm going to go, you know, pump gas or do whatever it is that they got to do, you know, coach, whatever. Um, but uh, no, Minner Min was in a hard place. That I can speak to a, 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 as, as a fact, and it's something that nobody's talking about. John Morgan gave a press release today. Did, did you listen to it, Todd? Yeah, I did listen to it, and, and, and he didn't say much of anything. Yeah, to his credit, I'll give John Morgan credit. He read the UFC press, releases, press release, which is something he actually does quite well at, re reading their press release, but he didn't expand on it. It's be, and, and he was honest. He's like, I don't know. I know this is what's going on. I don't know anything about about it. It'd be nice if he investigated a little bit. I mean, he calls himself a journalist. 
But at the end of the day, he was kind to James Krause, which is what you're supposed to be in instances like this. You know, anybody piling in James Krause right now, who I have no connection with, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult person to really be friends with when they're cheering for somebody that's in a, in a pretty messed up spot. Now, I want to ask you guys something um, that I had told you about, which was since the show after the Gambler's Perspective podcast with uh, Kalikas and Kalikas. Yanni, yes. the, the Greek Karyas or something, I think. Yeah, they're awesome. fantastic. You guys, They've had three shows show. since then, and they have not touched this story at all, even though they it's been developing, it. developing, developing. They're, they're not a new show, Todd. They're an ads show. True, but it is a gambling, MMA okay. gambling issue. Okay. Why have they avoided it? It's because the UFC press corps is filled with what I refer to as press titutes. They're there for free tickets. They're not there to tell anybody. You know, Ariel Hawani, I, I, I don't like him like as a journalist, but I, yeah, I got to hand it to him with stuff like this. He's at least bringing it forward, which pretty much is the reason that may, he may have saw his way out of the UFC kind of inner circle so yeah, at the end of the day you know Kalikas i respect makes, ariel you gotta have a little bit of respect for him Kalikas makes his money off odds and it doesn't what this does is it shakes up the integrity of the sport it shakes up the integrity that that secret bond so are people who gamble every once in a while on the ufc going to just stop doing it then is it worth it for the casinos to carry the numbers. The reason they are in bed with the UFC is because they started out small, they figured things out, they saw that there is an audience out there betting on it and stuff. So they want your money. So for them to say, we can't take bets on this sport at any level, like even if it just Ontario did or whatever, for them to say, we cannot take bets on this sport because we cannot guarantee that it's fair to you. That's a huge black eye on the UFC. As well, so, so, but let's again, talk about let's talk about jujitsu. These jujitsu guys, they're broke, man. Like they're doing it because they love it. They're doing it for the pure love of the sport. There's people out there doing jujitsu odds. Sure, no, Miguel, I understand. I understand Miguel, that you, but, Miguel, but, but how much money do they take? Because that's the problem. Is once the they're UFC small. broke through, they're now Miguel, getting the big money. All right, on our podcast, Lights Out Podcast, little shill right there you know, for for what it is Miguel and I do, we've had several people come out and say they did fixed fights in ADCC, including Matt Sarah. There was no odds at that time for Matt's fight. Uh, Jeremy Horn and Matt Hughes did a fake ADCC fight. Go through our catalog. We've got almost 150 interviews. Dig through them. It's all history. It's in there. Yeah, so, my, I mean, the guy, the guy from Fight to Win takes odds for jiu-jitsu. Nobody was taking odds on ADCC at that time. So, who cares? No, but, 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 but Seth from Fight to Win does. He, he does it over his Instagram. I mean, it's not I like I'm sitting here, oh, you know, Seth from Fight to Win. I don't understand how, how, I don't understand how you're, what you're relating Jeremy Horn's work with Matt Hughes on a fight that nobody took odds. Like, well, how is that relevant to this conversation? Was there a money? value attached to that to the what jeremy horn Matt Hughes. best throw quickest submission yes now i'm just saying it happens at the highest levels of grappling the examples i gave was that's, pretty that's why most books don't take odds on it but when some cross the line and do the ufc benefited from those that chose to do that 20 years ago because then they wouldn't be taking odds. But since then, because they were also casino owners and knew how to grow it, they become a frontline sport. And now they do bring in a lot of money, which is why things are behaving differently. But they went through this growth process where they were an absolute shit sport. And nobody would take money on them except for a select few sport books. And now it's grown into what it is. Jiu-Jitsu may or may not do that. But again, if you're playing with, uh, like I made a $2,000 bet on you know, Ryan Gordon and Ryan Gordon, you know, loses or whatever. And, and I bet against him. I, I win, I may win a fortune. I may win $20,000. The sports don't care about anything like that. No, that's Too shit small. money. 
You it's know, too small. And, and, and the grappling part is, look, like, if they started to do work, you'd see if they were blatant, if they became uh, all over the place, you'd start to see less and less people willing to risk being a house for that sport. That's yeah, what's at risk up here. That's what's at risk here is that many houses may say, yeah, we're not going to take the risk of betting on UFC. They can't even handle whether some of the fights are fake or not. And if they start dropping, that, that all that business is a big problem for the Chat. UFC. Yeah, Miguel, you're you're going in and out, buddy. I think I, I think we gotta wrap this one up, Todd. Well, let me see if I I want to see if I can ask Miguel one more question. I know he's breaking up. Yeah, he, we're getting every third word. Yeah. Um, let me see if we can get this though. You know, you worked with Nick Kalikas. I I mentioned that they have kind of buried this story on their show. Just just talk to me about that from your perspective, right quick. Yeah, I, I think I think it would be great if Nick told us everything he thought on this because he's the ultimate insider. And we, myself, Mike, you, everybody would, would really learn what an insider is really thinking. But I think that's I think there it is. That's the reason for it. At the end of the day, he makes money off of gambling. And when gambling is put at risk by something like this, I could see him not wanting to touch it. He may also have been very wrong about that particular fight when he gave out, you know, like suggestions for odds and things. And, uh, you know, may want to just sweep it under the table for embarrassment. At the end of the day, he'll go on and keep doing what he's doing. But his audience and things was shook up by that. You know what I mean? The, the houses don't like to bet, you know, don't like to pay out, you know, more than they took in. So any your house that did that has a, a problem with James Krause, has a problem with the sport, has, goes to the UFC and the UFC – you know, they tell them, look, are, you, are there other fake fights? They, they, they're they not going to play nice. They'd have no reason to be like, oh, we forgive you. So now the entire integrity of the sport is at risk. So I'm not surprised. Um, you know, Nick probably knows the way this is going to go better than any of us, but I'm not surprised that he's not, sh- you know, shedding. I wouldn't touch it. I wouldn't touch it if I were him. Now, Mike, before we close out, I just want to ask you this. I wanted to go a little bit more into the Josh Thompson thing, Josh Thompson, John McCarthy thing, because another thing they mentioned were that the FBI is already going to people and saying you were involved in this, blah, blah, blah. So they're kind of, this is also kind of irresponsible because it's not out Todd, there at all. Todd, if you're investigating something, you have to talk to people. And when our first time we covered this, we had said the investigative process only the investigative process it's gonna be about 16 months to two years just the investigative process so are the feds talking to people of course it's part of it are they baiting people with different questions that's the game are you asking me what advice i would give to people or what do you know? They're saying, oh, people are flipping on people already. How could they know that? No, I, you know, I mean, here's the bottom line is, is uh, if the feds are starting to make, like I said, you know, just break this down. I need to know from all the boxing commissions, every single fight James Krause was licensed as a corner man at, everybody, every single fight that he's licensed as a trainer for, and perhaps even every single fight that he's fought in. So once they have all that information, they know how far back they have to go. It's so tough. now let's say he's right. He goes right. <laughs> so, right but what so, I'm saying so, is, so, but, but, how but can minute. these guys on this show know that people are flipping on already? It's, it's, it's your they can't. Well, it's, they it's very simple because if they if the feds have already contacted thirty or forty people on this list, all it takes is one or two of them to call up their buddy Josh or Big John. And say, yeah, I got invested. They asked me about it. They did this. So the word, the word is going to get out as the investigation spread. And I think that would be the source for them is people in the sport who have confided in them that they've been involved. Now, the interesting thing would be is, did they give a name? Do they have a name of who? Or people are just flipping on them already. So it's like, look, you know, when you get. There might not be anything to flip on. I mean, people yeah, are you, just if, telling the truth. I don't like James. You know, this is what know, he did to me. He was a dick or I didn't like him. It, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. But just as an example, let's say he cornered a fighter five years ago who's no longer in the UFC and actually no longer in the sport. 
moved on. Guy sitting in his office or, you know, sitting wherever, whatever he's doing now, he's pumping gas, you know, or working McDonald's or whatever. And here come the feds. Hey, you know, we talked to your boss. You got today off. You're coming with us. And they said, take him to an office and they sit him down. And now he's talking about what was a previous life to him. That could go any which way. And that's why, you know, people are turning. Yeah, I didn't like him. Do you think he's capable of this? Oh, yeah, you know, he was shady this way. Or, you know, he's he's wild with a bunch of other stuff and speculation. I mean, I don't know exactly. But Mike doesn't paint a good picture for the questioning. What if that, that is one of the questions? Do you think James Crown's capable of this? How many of 40 or 50 or 100 people are all going to say yes? How many of, of those 100 people are just going to say, yeah, I do think he's capable of it? Even yeah. if it's one or five, he's in, he's going, this investigation Got will must. So I'm not surprised they know Got what they said, but they said nothing. Uh, without the names of who's breaking bad, they've said nothing. Got Look up. You know, people always talk about, like, Miguel, you're a thousand percent correct. One angry person could say whatever, and you can't control what comes out of somebody's mouth. If you're asking my opinion, if I'm James Krause, I'm asking the investigator how long he's been on the job, how many investigations he's done. You know, like, give me some cases that, that, that you've made come together. It's all public knowledge because if you got a guy trying to make a name for himself, like when you go into a car dealership, they try to upsell you. Hey, yo, we got the rust coating. We got the undercarriage. We've got the heated seats. Have you tried the, you know, the, the cooling aspect of it yet? You get a guy that knows how to sell himself to a judge in order to get his name in the paper, you're going to wind up like Michael Nunn. Michael Nunn had a friend that kept trying to sell him cocaine. Michael Nunn said no a dozen times. One time he goes, all right, dude, bring me a key of Coke for 250 bucks. Or it was under $500 for a key of Coke. Something at that time was close to 20 grand. They arrested Michael Nunn. And then they said, we're going to up your, the length of your sentence based on the, the fact that you might have had a gun. We didn't see it. He didn't produce it. Yeah, Our witnesses said he probably had it. And Michael Nunn goes, no, no, no. I'm fighting this. Like Nunn did 20 years in jail for that. Like, you want to talk about racism in sentencing? The one example that nobody ever gives is Michael Nunn. I've talked to him on the phone. I've asked him to bring us through it. It's so painful for him that he refuses to even address it. And, you know, in James Cross's case, to me, he comes across, you know, he's probably a guy who thinks he's smart, and he's probably been taken as smart by a lot of people for a lot of years. He's not a dumb guy in, in general, but this is a great time to find a little humility and not talk about how smart you are because you're not real smart in terms of like, for example, talking in public about giving out or, or collecting passwords and stuff. Everybody whose password, every site that you've used a fake password on will shut you down. It's in their body. It's what they do. So that wasn't very smart, not knowing that. And also adding, you know, things up. If, if that number of a million dollars in total bets you know, from our, our source to Kraus, then yeah, he's at a new limit in terms of the amount of money there. And a million dollars is enough to get anybody, any book's attention. And again, what he did is there's a high roller process. There are guys that bet that amount on every single fight, but they've talked to their bookie personally and stuff like that. And they have a relationship and they deal with it. And the house knows, the house knows I'm $8 million down to this guy. Get him back here, you know, send him bonuses, do something. But that's the game. They want him back. The more he comes back, they'll get their money. But when an outsider, not worth a million, is putting up a, a few dollars like that, they will crush that. And they don't want anyone involved in that special million-dollar club and those types of bets and stuff like that. Who knows what goes on there, officially and unofficially. But that's what they don't. Re that's what they really don't want the feds to be looking at. I think, in my opinion. So what will happen is is that every one of these entities. The books, the casinos, the commissions, the feds, every one of them is now working to crush Kraus. So he better find a little bit of humble pie immediately and, you know, figure out how to keep as quiet as possible and stop, you know, stop trying to look bigger than you are because this is the consequence of you trying to look bigger than you are.
sorry. I'm, I think that's a great thing to wrap up on, you know. And uh, so, again, this is Todd Atkins. Until the next time, from the MMA detective Mike Davis and veteran matchmaker Miguel Iterati of the Lights Out podcast. Be sure to check out the MMA Conspiracy Hour and leave us some comments on what you think. Take care.